Great. So we'll start the way we do every week. And you can just find yourself into a comfortable enough sitting position where we can uh, be together for about a half an hour. And once you found a posture that feels suitable for your body and heart right now, and just see if it feels possible to establish an intention in the mind to remain here, to accept the conditions. and commit to see what we can learn from them. Noticing what it feels like to make an intention such as this. Maybe there's a felt sense of resolve. Or confidence. Or maybe there's some doubt in the mind and that's okay too. You might want to take a couple of deep breaths just to invite the nervous system to be easeful. Even in just this ritual of deep breathing at the beginning of a sit, we're just reminding the system that it's okay to be intimate, that it's safe to be intimate. And we just follow the breathing patterns as they are without any demand. Feeling the breath move in the body. Each breath slightly different. As this body is different in each moment.
the relationship to the breath, slightly different. This regular activity of breathing in this act of relating to the breath in a constant state of flow. Not static. Allowing the mind, the heart to lean in and fully experience this whole integrated experience of breathing right here in the body. With each inhale, we're breathing in the world. And with each exhale, we're contributing. Renewing and deepening into the present moment with each, with each breath cycle. We're a part of the world, the world's a part of us. Right here. Not trying to hold on to the way it is for us in any moment. No need to hold on to any in breath. No need to look for the perfect exhale. Just accepting all of the conditions just as they are, the breath as it is, 
the world as it is, our participation just as it is. Breath, body, heart, mind, internal, external, all participating. An interconnected human experience. We know this just by following the breath. And the in breath. Knowing the out breath. Breath is not ours. It arises naturally. The breath just like this, it's a force of nature. Remembering that it's our job to find some balance, valuing both relaxation and ease, and also the kind of persistent, steady effort, steady application of effort, moment by moment. And you'll know because you'll feel it. If there's some, some out of balance state happening. And see what you can do to make an adjustment. What feels right to either remind this being that what we're doing here is important. Or to remind this being that, sweetie, you just get to rest. Rest in awareness, deepening and renewing an interest in the present moment.
You can open your eyes when you're ready. Thank you for your practice. You might want to stretch your body a bit. <clears throat> yeah, it's nice at the beginning just to look around. Look at the Zoom squares, say hello to people that you see when you come on Wednesday. Hello, everyone. Even if people don't have their videos on, you can just, you know, take in their names and appreciate having a community to practice with. So <clears throat> I spent a few weeks talking about belonging, different aspects of belonging. And tonight we're going to move on and spend tonight and probably a few weeks um, doing a deep dive into samadhi. And we'll use uh, Kitasaro and Tanisara's book listening to the heart. Jessica's listed it in the chat. Listening to the heart, a contemplative journey to engage Buddhism. And the first couple of chapters are also uh, scanned and posted on the calendar. And the chapter that I'll be using as a jumping off place is chapter three, and it's also posted in the chat. A PDF is in the chat for you. But if you don't, if it's not easy to open there, just go to Common Grounds calendar and you can find a copy of it there. It's not very long, but really packed full of uh, good instruction. So we'll dig in together over the next few weeks. So this chapter is uh, written by Kitty Saro, and it's called The Steady Mind. So tonight I'll give kind of an overview of where we're heading together over the next few weeks. Uh, um, Get an overview of samadhi and some of the ways that we'll entertain practicing with uh, this teaching and yeah just a sense of the territory the terrain that we'll explore together over the next several weeks i think this chapter is um, a good reminder for me of how uh, just the poetic way that Kitty Saro describes practice. And for me, he, it's just a very integrated style that really lands and this heart really appreciates that. Um, so I'll take a similar approach um, as we head into this territory together as well. And the first thing just to name is that you know, we learn the teachings of the Buddha through the suttas, really. The, the teachings are described in the discourses of the Buddha that were written down many years after the Buddha's death. It was, they were collected as an oral tradition um, and then later written down about 400 years after the death of the Buddha. 
So there's, you know, an interesting way to study the suttas. And one of those ways is to look for uh, connections throughout the suttas to try to understand what the essence of the teachings. And this, this word sutta um, means, can be translated to mean thread. And so each of the teachings we can think about as threads that weave together a beautiful cloth. So we can take one of them out, one of the threads, and look at it. We can look through the suttas and understand what the patterns are and what the Buddha was really trying to say and what the essence of the teachings are. And then we can always remember to kind of go back to the whole cloth, like what's the essence here of the Buddhist path? What's the whole, what's the eightfold path? What is the whole, what is the Buddha trying to say? What are we doing here as practitioners in this human form, learning? Like, what is this thing that we're doing here? So often there's, we come to um, understand this thread, this teaching of samadhi with a kind of a limited view and use this limited view, we often it's described as concentration. And so we tend to, in my experience, both as a practitioner and also talking to many practitioners, uh, either berating ourselves about how we don't have good concentration or competing with ourselves to have better concentration or sizing us up, sizing ourselves up to other practitioners like, oh, they have better concentration or oh, look, their concentration must not be so good because they're falling asleep, something like this, right? So that's what we could consider as a wrong view of practice and, and a very limited understanding of samadhi, this idea that samadhi is exclusively a concentration, right? A concentration in the mind, often a, used to describe a, a one-pointed awareness. So if the mind lands on the breath and then stays on the breath, you know, moment by moment by moment. And that is one way to think about or to consider samadhi, but it's not a full understanding. Dharma is always influenced by context and history. So we want to take samadhi in connection with the entire path and apply the teachings to these unique times we're living in. And this is what we'll be doing. We'll be understanding samadhi with a broad view. We might go dive in and take a more acute look, and then we might widen the view and take a more integrated look, and always questioning how samadhi, how this teaching of samadhi really applies directly to our lives today. These, and these are unique times we're living in. I think we could all agree. Most of us have never lived through a global pandemic that's shifting and changing every day. And we're also in the current, um, in a current civil rights movement. So we're participating in these experiences all the time, whether we know it or not. We're participating in a civil rights movement. We're participating in a global pandemic. We're doing this in our, some ways in our engagement, even in the subtle activity of the mind, the subtle inner activity of the heart and mind. So we might not see that moment by moment, but it's true. And the more we, the more we dive into the experience of understanding samadhi, the may, more we may um, see that how true that is. We have to allow ourselves to be shaped by this moment so profoundly actually and in the deepest ways, surrendering to impermanence. And this is what the Dharma is, a, a deep, a, the deepest intimacy with life, a commitment to being intimately connected with reality. So our Buddhist training, our Dharma training is in a sense, 
seeing how close we can get to the flow of life. And the closer we can get to the flow of life, the, the more clearly we start to understand the depth of the teachings and the truth, right? The truth of our experience. The way we practice and even the way we teach the Dharma these days must shift too with the changing conditions of our lives. And so we're, we're making the Dharma really accessible and applicable to here and now. I mean, just in our experience with doing online gatherings now, we're meeting on Zoom or we're going on YouTube live stream to connect with Sangha, to hear the teachings, to participate in a collective experience of Dharma, receiving, giving and receiving. Yeah, so we can see that we're in a state of flow already. Things are always changing. And it's here that as we lean into this reality of change, of constant change, of constant flow, of not resisting what's moving in our hearts in, internally and also our external reality that we really touch the depths of our learning. And like many of you, I'm a, I'm, I feel deeply committed to Dharma practice and the joy of teaching or even the possibility of teaching really only comes from a, a feeling into our shared humanity deeply caring about making a contribution. And so I'm making a contribution and you're also making a contribution by showing up on these Wednesday nights, engaging in your practice, getting interested in what practice, you know, how this shakes out for you and moment to moment experience in your daily life in between Wednesday nights. And in this way, we start to realize how interconnected we actually are. So my ask again this week is the same as it's been many weeks prior. Instead of just believing what I'm saying, believing what I'm sharing with you, my ask is that you dedicate yourself to practicing in service of our collective awakening. So you land right here with the words in your heart and body and you see what moves. And you use your learning to seed learning in the next moment. And in the next moment, and in the next moment. And if we can all commit to doing this together, this will make the ancestors, the earth, and our teachers really happy. <laughs> So what is Samadhi? Kitty Sara opens up with a quote from the Buddha. A mind that has Samadhi, a mind that is gathered will naturally see things the way they actually are and be freed from confusion. So some of the ways that Samadhi is often translated into English, the word concentration comes forward the word continuity of awareness comes forward. So sometimes when concentration is used to describe the experience of samadhi, it again points to that the mind that can collect or gather often on a single experience and land and land and land and land. And it's in that process of landing and present moment awareness again and again and again that this heart starts to feel into deeper understandings, like the truth of change. When we start to see that, for example, when we're with the breath, moment by moment by moment, that the breath is always, that it's hard to actually land on the breath because there's so much going on there. You might have noticed this yourselves, like just with the in-breath, where, do where does the breath begin? There, and there's so much movement happening, right? And it's felt in the body in different ways. And then what happens in the heart and the mind, the thoughts or the emotions impact the breath. And so there's this 
kind of total integrated mind body experience happening here and our breath is influenced by the outer conditions you know the heat or the humidity and whatever else So this unification or collectedness of mind gatheredness. When I ask myself this question in preparing for this talk, like it's always a good idea to just kind of drop all the words, drop the teachings in moments and just land here in this heart, mind, body experience and go like, what does this actually feel like? So what, so I did that today. Like what does Samadhi actually feel like? And when I asked this question, what came to mind is a deep and renewing relationship with the present moment. So a deep and renewing relationship. It's a deep and a deepening yes, again and again and again. It's, and that's such a broader view. If you think about Samadhi as being a deep, integrated and renewing relationship, that's a much broader view of the teaching than concentration, the, the capacity of awareness to land in an experience such as breathing moment by moment by moment. But really the experience of samadhi is so much more than that. And so we can shake up our relationship with samadhi. If I ask the question now, and maybe some of you will feel brave enough to write it in the chat, what, in one or two words, what has your relationship been with samadhi? So we have to remember, and you can do that whenever you want, if you'd like to. We have to remember again to take a look at the cloth and remember that the Buddha wasn't interested in attainments. The Buddha was interested in suffering and the end of suffering. So we can get curious about our relationship to samadhi and the relationship of the relationship, samadhi's relationship to our entire life. So the Buddha was interested in using the mind to know the mind and to relate wisely and skillfully to our lives and to the world in the interest of understanding suffering and the cessation of suffering. So the, the Buddha's map for a skillful, loving, wise life is this map of the Noble Eightfold Path. And so in, in the path, the path is broken into three major areas, this area of wisdom, this area of samadhi, and this area of ethics. So in the area of wisdom, we have right view and right intention. In the area of ethics, we have the activities of body, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then in the area of samadhi, we have right mindfulness, right concentration, and right effort. So over the next few weeks, we'll start to see how samadhi is integrated in, our to in the total path. Right? We'll see the cloth in this way. What is the path? How does samadhi interact with the other path factors, with, a, with our ethical training and with wisdom? And we'll also see how these three aspects of samadhi, they're kind of hard to tease apart at times. Mindfulness, concentration, we can exchange that word for continuity or deepening into the present moment deep and renewing relationship with the present moment and an effort. So effort, mindfulness, continuity of awareness. You know, these are all aspects of our training in Samadhi. 
that influence one another. And it's okay if this feels a little bit like, hmm, right now, maybe even a little confusing or a little heady, because as we practice with it, we don't have to know, it's not so much of a cognitive experience, it's actually a lived one. So as we start to practice with and live into and feel into in an embodied way, the experience of samadhi it will start to, will start to know it. And it's better to know it than to be able to describe it in words. And I'll be particularly interested to explore with you the intersection of samadhi and ethics because I think this directly relates to our role as responsible citizens. And especially now as we participate in disrupting racism, understanding whiteness and disrupting um, the tenets of dominance, both in our own hearts and in the expressions that we're seeing more visibly now in the world. So this is Kitty Saro's description of Samadhi, or one of them, in the beginning of chapter three. And he's, yeah, he says that the Thai forest master Ajahn Tate described the essential purpose of meditation as discerning the difference between mind and activity of mind. In order to see the difference, there needs to be steadiness of attention. The steadiness called Samadhi. Samadhi is usually translated as concentration or one-pointedness, though this term can give the impression that the mind has to be narrow like an ice pick. For many meditators, just the word concentration starts to make them feel uneasy and tense. I prefer to translate samadhi as gathered or centered. In samadhi, the energies of body, speech, and mind are suffused with awareness and become unified. The energies of body, speech, and mind are suffused with awareness and become unified. Now, doesn't that sound like a really integrated experience? and perhaps a little more full than what we might imagine if we think about uh, samadhi as a one-pointed awareness, an activity of awareness. We can often, when we start to look at our experience, our, our experience with samadhi, our relationship to samadhi actually, we start to see how closely connected it is to effort. It's often our efforting to try to be concentrated, right? Do you have this experience as a meditator? You sit down in the on the cushion and your intention, instead of um, wanting to be in alignment with the present moment, we start with a maybe invisible intention to be concentrated and calm, right? Nod your head if you're with me, if that's, if that's ever happened to you. <laughs> if not, look out for it because I can almost guarantee that it's lurking just beneath the surface in some moments. So we want to explore our relationship to, to samadhi and see if we can come into uh, a more wise alignment or with a more wise view of what of how samadhi is actually a, uh, one of just one of the uh, suttas that weave together the cloth that we're using to understand our lives of what it means to be human. And samadhi tends to be a pleasant feeling. Right? When, the mind, when the mind is collected, when there's, some, integra there's in some energy towards integration, there's a, a, a pleasant feeling. And you might, you might notice this from time to time, even when you're off the cushion, especially when you're off the cushion, you're walking around in your daily life, 
and you're with the intention to be present, to be there both in heart and body and with the external conditions as they are, when there's some acceptance of the flow of life, there is a, an ease in the constitution. And you can feel that and get a sense of what this, what this um, experience of samadhi is in that moment. And also when you're on the cushion, when the heart is connected to the flow of life here, whether it be to follow the breath or to just watch experience come and go without um, connecting and sustaining the attention on any one particular experience. So the experience of continuity could be one of receiving of this heart being willing to say yes to any experience of heart, mind, body, breath, thought, feeling, sound, emotion. You know, these are some of the options here. So the mind might say yes to a body sensation and then in the next moment say yes to a sound, notice a sound. And then in the next moment feel the beads of sweat on the face. And then in the next moment have a, an emotion that's known in the heart. And this uh, capacity of the of, of this uh, mind body to track of awareness to track moment by moment by moment mindful a moment of mindfulness and another moment of mindfulness and another moment of mindfulness like this is what we call continuity of awareness and it's another way of describing uh, concentration actually or the experience of samadhi right so these are a couple of ways that you can get to know the experience in your own practice, both walking around in daily life and your own formal sitting practice. And you can test it out, like see, get curious, like, okay, what's it like to have an anchor, to use the breath as an anchor, for example, and stay with the breath as a total integrated experience, right? Landing and renewing, our interest in the present moment again and again, while the attention is connecting and sustaining with the breath, uh, get, get to know what that's like. And then in, on another day, practice a different way. Practice not taking up an anchor, but just receiving experience as it comes into your awareness, right, as it flows through. So you might notice a sound and then notice a body sensation Again, you're just tracking, tracking, tracking experience and understanding what that feels like. And then when you're off the cushion, moving about in your daily life, you're doing dishes, you're taking care of your house, you're out in the world doing whatever it is that you're doing, walking in your neighborhood or participating in our social world in some way. You can, again, have the intention to land in a fully to understand what it's like to be integrated, to be connected in a deep and integrated way, both with internal and external conditions without demanding anything, just total acceptance, because this is the experience of Samadhi, total acceptance of the way things are. And then you might feel like, what is that like? Oh, so you start to get a taste, a more full taste, a more a deeper, richer taste of the experience of samadhi. So it's, it's not that samadhi can feel pleasant and that pleasantness can uh, rival any other pleasant experience and even convince us that we've somehow arrived at a, a, an important place. And so we want to remember that when these pleasant, when this pleasant taste is there, that it's a, an important to understand our relationship to that pleasant experience, to get interested in that pleasant experience and, and what it leads us towards. I still remember the, the first uh, short retreat that I went on uh, with, common, with the Common Ground community and a very um, slight taste of samadhi that is, has stayed with me even to this day. So it can, it can really leave a lasting impression. And we want to know what that's like because that good feeling, right, we can 
will we'll want to be able to harness that good feeling and be able to trust that it's useful to actually be connected in that way. It's useful. We want to know how useful it is in the heart to be connected so that it generates a faith in our heart, a confidence to want to continue to see where it takes us, right? Otherwise, we might say that it's too, it's too difficult and give up on samadhi, on the experience of, of um, total integrated and renewing presence in our lives. And when we do that, then we find something else to guide our lives. And oftentimes, it doesn't take us to a place of happiness, at least not to the place that we want to go. So it's not, samadhi is not the end of the path, it's a part of the path to be integrated both with wisdom and with ethics, right? These three aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path. So wisdom reminds us that samadhi is just a force of nature, available when the conditions are right and when the conditions aren't there. There's not a thing that we can do to make, to make the attention gather or collect in that way, except to care about seeding the conditions, right? Giving, uh, supporting what might uh, support you know, planting the seeds of the, uh, supporting the conditions that will give rise to samadhi again in the future. But in that moment, when some, when there's no, when it doesn't feel like we don't have that kind of integrated experience, then we just get to practice accepting that too. And so here is where our um, experience and exposure to effort comes in. Because if we are just striving to get, to attain some pleasant state, then we're missing what we're doing on the path. We want to make efforts that are in line with contribute, contributing to clear seeing. We want to make efforts that are contributing to understanding suffering and the end of suffering. We want to make efforts that contributing that contribute to uh, seeing into some of the deep, deepest truths that the Buddha pointed to: this truth of interdependence, this truth of impermanence, this truth of nature. I went over. I talked quite a bit about uh, anatta last week. This experience of understanding uh, the impersonal nature of all experience, both internal and external. And we want to continue to be able to see all the impersonal forces that influence this moment without tipping into some kind of feeling about helplessness, of helplessness. The world is largely an unfolding of many impersonal forces. Many are internal, some are external. And so we bring into mind, we bring into view we bring into view all that we can so that we can understand deeply and feel into this truth of impersonal, what's, in, what's impersonal. At the heart of our predicament as human beings is this um, misperception that we somehow um, that that somehow this is our fault, right? whatever this experience is. And it's not that it's our fault, that's not correct understanding, but it is our responsibility, right? So we learn by when, when we are practicing in alignment, you know, we don't have to have experiences of calm or deep connection. We can also practice it with all of the non-samadhi experiences too. 
we can practice with every moment that there's doubt in the mind or fear in the mind or anger in the mind or frustration or rejection or any of the unpleasant emotions. We can practice with all of those moments too because we can, we can understand something about nature here. We can understand that we can see, we can learn, we can commit to learning and our own exploration in the interest of seeing how deeply conditioned these habits are, how deeply conditioned this habit of fear is in this heart. And it arises naturally due to its conditioning, right? Not due to some personal problem that Shelley's. We can also see how deeply conditioned dominance is in the United States. We can track centuries of, uh, oh, Zoom woes. <laughs> Thanks for waiting. <laughs> I wanna have a little time for questions, but I wanna make this point that I was trying to get to right before I got booted out of Zoom land. And just directly, we don't have to believe that this deeply integrated and renewing experience that we can call samadhi is useful. We don't have to believe that, but we just have to keep looking at the result, right? At the result when we are, when we intend to be, and when we are intimate, when we are there, when we're fully present and we feel into that experience. We can see if there's some pleasantness there. We can see if there's some satisfaction there. So in this way, we learn to find a way to enjoy the work of practice. We can see that practice doesn't mean only calm states or pleasant, pleasant mind states. We, don't, we can learn that practice, the practice of transforming the heart isn't easy but we can learn to appreciate through this practice, through this teaching of samadhi, we can actually learn to value and to enjoy the work of practice. We can see that it feels good to be in alignment. I don't know about you, but I've been feeling this in some moments throughout my life these last uh, couple of months as I live into, feel into in this heart. Um, what seems to be our reckoning, our collective reckoning with the roots of whiteness. And although the reality and what I'm learning moment by moment is hard to absorb, it's hard to, um, it's hard to take it in all the time. It's hard to know, it's hard to feel uh, even clear, right? The heart does all kinds of weird things, shuts down, gets angry, lands in confusion, it's hard to be there. But there's this appreciation, there's a little bit of joy in the effort that it takes to be in alignment. So appreciating the practice, appreciating the effort to practice, enjoying the work of practice. And unless we can get to this place this remembering to appreciate the work of practice we won't want to keep doing it it will be hard so you can ask that ask yourself that question throughout your day like okay is there some is there some way to uh, bring in an attitude of mind that appreciates or enjoys this work of intimacy this work of connecting and aligning both internally and externally with truth. As we learn to do that more and more, it will become more and more interesting to continue that work. And as we continue that work, then we will, we will naturally grow in understanding, deepen our understanding. We will more fully understand the truth of impermanence. We will full, more fully understand what, what nature really is all about. We will fully understand dukkha. We will fully understand how to belong to each other. 
So our work can become, our work of practice can become enlivening. I watched this video today of, I've seen this before, but it was circling around on Facebook. It was this video of a father and child and the child was having a meltdown and the video was like five minutes or seven minutes or something like that. And the father said nothing, but he was sitting in this little naked child on the ground, just really emotionally distraught and kind of flailing around and you know stomping and leaning up against the wall and then eventually the, the father just stood there um bearing witness you know in in his body language just saying it's okay you can do this you know you can have all the expressions that you want to have i'm going to be right here for you and eventually the child started crawling on the father and um, on occasion leaned in and then the father would, you know, follow the child's lead. And if the child really leaned in, he would lean in back. And if the child pushed away, he would let them go. The child started climbing. He was just protecting the child to make sure the child was safe. And then eventually the child leaned in for longer and the, the father just hugged the child, rocked the child. And then eventually the child just curled up and let the child let the father just hold and soothe the child you know while the child sort of like you know post cry with all the <laughs> breathing hyperventilating and it was such a precious experience like yeah it is so hard sometimes doing the work that we're doing of waking up as human beings of being with the flow of you know, just the flow of emotion is enough, but being with the flow of life in all ways and all forms can be really hard. So finding some way to be that, you know, parent that can just go like, yep, it's going to be okay. You can trust this experience. You can trust this intimacy. This is how you learn. You learn how to really embrace all of life right here in these moments. And we learn something about um, the, the, the strength of their resiliency, the strength and resiliency of our systems as human beings, when we can uh, touch great difficulty, great pain with intimacy and interest and uh, keep going, right? You've all probably learned many times throughout your life uh, the strength that you didn't know you had as you've gone through something very difficult. Yeah. So even hard lessons. All right. There's much more to say. Um, and I'll continue next week. So we have about eight or nine minutes left. Would love to hear from you, any comments you have, any reflections on your own experience with Samadhi, any connections that you've made already in your own heart tonight by listening to hopefully some reflections about internal experience and external realities related to Samadhi. Hmm. Love the story about the dad. Would like to try that with myself and people in my life. Yeah. It's a great place to begin. I'm a big fan of using the fabric of our lives for to support our awakening. Sometimes we get this idea that we have to go do something grand or look for a better place to practice or a better organization to participate in yet there's so much to learn right here in these moments when we are falling apart and we don't know what to do and we learn how to reach out to our community for support and we learn how to soothe ourselves and we learn how to bring both wisdom and compassion right here we can learn these 
what we need to learn when we're washing the dishes, when we're doing really ordinary things. Feel free to just unmute yourself and if you have something to say. Hey, Shelly and everyone. Could you, um, so I really did, I love that story about the dad and trying to think of, you could maybe talk about like, how could we, how could we start with practicing that with ourselves? Like, how, what would that look like? Do you have um, any kind of suggestions? Well, I'm curious what you do now. What do you do when you're having a meltdown? Um, what do I do when I'm, well, I don't, I don't really have melt meltdowns, but um, adult style get, meltdowns. Yeah, adult style melt, meltdowns. Um, I well, usually the first thing I do, I'll do it is like get mad at myself or turn it inward, you know, and put it in, put it on myself. And then as soon as I see myself doing that, usually I write. I get out my journal and I start writing, and or I go for a walk first. But whatever it is, it always brings me to writing. I usually, you know come down that's how I usually that's how I hug myself I guess um just kind of checking in with myself and you know where am I at and why am I feeling this way and, and that sort of thing that's kind of what I do now I guess yeah thank you we tend to have really high expectations for ourselves and especially I think one of the shadows um, that comes with being a practitioner is because we're practicing, we shouldn't have adult style meltdowns or we should be able to be more equanimous even in moments when we feel angry or we shouldn't be afraid when we're afraid. So we can really um, just practice holding ourselves gently in these moments and realizing, oh, this is what it's like to be human. You know, sometimes that simple move, like I'm feeling really afraid or I'm feeling really anxious, just touching my heart or putting my hands on my chest. And often it's, I just say like, oh, this is what it's like to be a human being. And somehow it makes it a little bit less personal, right? Like, oh, this is a human emotion. All human beings experience fear. All human beings get cranky. All human beings are irrational from time to time. And look at this, like with some humility, I see myself connected with the whole lineage of human beings right here. And so just taking a moment and breathing it in, really letting it land, this understanding, no matter how fragile, that I am in good company with other human beings, right? Already orients the mind in the direction of something beautiful interconnection, less personal, more nature oriented, right here rooted in compassion. You know, it's a beautiful and very simple exercise. It doesn't take, you know, it's not like a curriculum, just caring. Like, oh, how do I care? And it may be like you grab a pillow or it may be that you take a deep breath or Maybe that you take a walk and in those moments, whatever, do some writing and in those moments and you can connect that way. But we each will have our own, we each will have our own means to connect. Any other comments?
There's this um, a really good comment here in the chat. I often, from Kristen, I often feel that Samadhi is personal to me and I'm struggling to understand how it is interconnected to others. So I have a suggestion. I don't know if you've um, gone to the George Floyd Memorial area yet, the site where George Floyd was murdered, but if you haven't, um, it, you might consider just going there and with the intention to be fully present, no other intentions, right? Just to be fully present and to somehow find a way to appreciate the efforts of practice. And so you go there with this intention for samadhi in mind, right? You lean into practice, finding, you know, being willing to find that balance where the mind feels steady enough to stay there. And then you just walk around and you breathe in and you breathe out and you are a body in connection with other bodies and you read stuff and you feel the space and then just see what happens. Just see what happens. I'd be curious if anybody actually did that to come back next week and report what your experience was like. Well, let's leave it here for tonight. And for the last minute, let's just close our eyes together, let go of the words. Appreciating the space of learning that we've co-created and the efforts that we've made to be here fully and dedicating the merit of our practice outward to every inch of our suffering world. Thanks everyone. See you next week. Good night.